Pride Month, right? We're going to let our little light shine or our big light shine. <laughs> and now, um, friends, we continue through the stories of Jesus uh, as told to us by someone we call Mark. And uh, a couple of things that have happened up until now, uh, where we last week we talked about the feeding of uh, thousands with leftovers, there being enough. And um, for that was the uh, sad uh, death of John the Baptist, um, where Herod, the Jewish king, had uh, John beheaded. And um, prior to that, Jesus had been doing some healings and proclaiming good news. And some folks have been pushing up against Jesus' interpretation of the way that he embodies the faith. So let us hear now this old, old story. May it come alive for us in our time, in our place. Now when some of the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands. That is, they didn't wash their hands. For the Pharisees and the Jewish people, they do not generally eat unless they wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they don't eat anything from the market unless they wash it, and there are also many other traditions that they observe. The washing of cups and pots and bronze kettles and the washing of beds. So the Pharisees and the scribes, some of them asked Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders and eat with defiled hands? And Jesus said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. It is written, as it is written, the people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrine. You abandon the commandment of God and you hold to human tradition. Then Jesus said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your parents, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But you say that if anyone tells their parents, whatever support I might have had from, you might have had from me is Corbin, that is, is now an offering to God then you no longer permit doing anything for parents, thus nullifying the word of God through your tradition that you have handed on. And you do many things like this. Then Jesus called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile. But the things that come out of a person are what defiles. When Jesus had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about that parable. And Jesus said to them, so are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile? since it enters not the heart, but the stomach, and goes into the sewer. Then Mark adds in parentheses, thus Jesus declared all foods clean. There's a lot of debate about that, about whether he really did that. And uh, Jesus said, is it what comes out of a person? It is what comes out of a person that what is what defiles or makes them unholy or impure. For it is written, from the human heart is where evil intentions come, like sexual immorality, theft, 
murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, pride, folly, all of these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Oh, that's a lot. I invite us to rest in that for a minute. If there is anything we learned from COVID, surely it was wash your hands, <laughs> right? And how to wash our hands and when to wash our hands. So I might agree with the fair, some of the Pharisees on this one. Yes, please wash your hands. And not only that, we know that um, people can suffer from disease like salmonella and other uh, diseases if we don't wash our food properly and washing of pots and pans and dishes. Yeah, do that, right? I mean, how would you feel if you came in here on Sunday morning and the coffee cups were had mold in them from last week, nobody washed them, right? Yes, wash, wash your hands. Wash your cups, wash your food. So what's going on here? It seems like a fair question they're asking Jesus. Why don't your disciples wash their hands? But as usually with scripture, there's something else going on something deeper, something bigger that at first glance we might not notice because we are 21st century people living in the United States of America. We are very far removed from Jesus and the first century in Palestine. So we might need to look a little deeper to see what on earth is going on here. It is about a lot more than hand washing food washing, and doing our dishes. What it seems to be happening here is the fair, some of the Pharisees and the scribes are asking Jesus, are you all part of us or not? It's about identity and belonging. Because like most communities, the Jewish community in the first century had things that helped them identify who's part of the group, right? And who isn't. Now, we, know, we understand this. We know about this. We're in Pride Month. There's going to be rainbows everywhere, right? A sign, a sign of, yes, I'm inclusive. Yes, I belong, right? A sign of pride, which was listed in the things of, don't do that. But we know that there's a difference in, in having pride in one's identity as a beloved child of God, pride in belonging, and um, using pride in a way that belittles other people, right? Uh, so this is the, the religious leaders, some of them, seem to want to know from Jesus are you following the tradition of the elders? Because it doesn't look like you are. It doesn't look like you are. Be you belong to us. And that's what we want to know. And there was a lot of division and difference uh, in the Jewish community in the first century, just like there is today, just like there is co in community. Um, and so they had ways of identifying one another similar like team sports right you wear your your team's shirt i hope we'll wear ours uh so if i see you at the pride fest and you don't have your shirt on i might say are you part of us or not <laughs> no i'm not going to do that to you but that's kind of what they're doing right they're saying hey aren't you aren't you part of us have you abandoned the faith what's going on here why aren't you following the rules that that make you part of us and 
They also are asking the question because there was diversity within the faith. So like John the Baptist and the Essenes didn't follow some of the, the same rules that the Pharisees did. There was, in addition to having differences about hand washing, there was also uh, differences in foods, e eating particular foods, certain rituals, um, things that you wear and didn't wear, things to identify. And there was also differences in theology. So like, for example, uh, John the Baptist took immersion, which was for purity, cleansing one self so that you could go to the temple and participate. And he, uh, he reinterpreted it to be a sign of repentance and of belonging, right? Be baptized, repent, turn toward God. So there was uh, adaptation of the faith and diversity among so the religious leaders are asking who do you belong to are you with us or or not we uh we understand this there's lots of diversity in christianity and we also know what it's like to say are you part of us or not or for people to ask us that question and we even know what it's like to say, oh, well, we're not those Christians, right? I mean, sometimes we didn't even want to say we were a church. So we're not, we're not those Christians. That seems to be what's happening here. Are you with us or are you not? And I think it's kind of a fair question. Uh, we do a lot of explaining when we say, oh, we're, we're with downtown disciples, and people say, well, are you Christian? Well, we are, but, you know, and then we go on to explain. Um, so they, they had this question, and Jesus, I think, responds in a way that seems to be a little over the top for the question. Right? I mean, he, he really is cranked up on this. He he's like, calls them out as hypocrites. That's a big deal. And publicly humiliating them. So I'm like, what is, what is up? Is this one of those times when he's tired? He didn't have a, a good rest? He needs a sabbatical? He didn't get something good to eat? What is going on with Jesus that he would respond in such a harsh way? manner and i so i'm thinking about this and i was reading some biblical scholars and i'm trying to figure out why is jesus so uptight about this why doesn't he just say to them well you know we have a different way of interpreting that and da 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 da, da. no instead he really gets angry about it and i thought back to so many times that i had conversations with people about how I believe the scriptures are affirming of LGBTQ people and how the scriptures call us to do justice, right? To speak. I remember other times people would say to me, you know, oh, you're too political. And, and you know, I'm like, well, Jesus was political, right? Jesus, he faced the empire. He critiqued the empire. And we see him here being really uptight um, about interpretation of the faith. So I was thinking back to some of those times, you know, when I got tired, I got really frustrated with people wanting me to have to uh, explain to them why it's okay to love everybody. You know, why, why, it, why Christians want to affirm everybody as beloved people? I mean, sometimes I wanted to go, duh, hello, what is wrong with you? Which I think is what Jesus is doing, right? <laughs> Come on, what's up? Get, get with the program. Our faith is about love. Our faith is about compassion. Everybody belongs. Stop excluding people based on whether they wash their hands right or they did this or they did that. Jesus has given up. And he's frustrated because he's been working at this for a long time. And 
He also, I think he might be also carrying around a little grief from John the Baptist, you know, uh, beheading. That's a gruesome, violent, awful thing to have happen to anybody. And John the Baptist was Jesus' mentor, right? Uh, he baptized Jesus. They were family members. They were friends. Imagine that grief that he's carrying. And sometimes, you know, when we're grieving, we might not have as much patience as we would ordinarily to sit down and have another long explanation as to why God is the all-powerful, loving, forgiving, grace-filled God, right? I'm not going to argue with you all about theology anymore. Um, seems to be what he's saying. So maybe he's grieving, he's frustrated with this with this argument. He's having an interfaith debate with his people, right? So this is not Jesus critiquing Judaism. It is about Jesus uh, debating within his tradition. We do the same thing. We debate about important things of the faith. So, um, speaking of that, we have a couple of opportunities coming up that are going, I think, to empower us to, um, to be all that we say that we are in God. Um, in addition to Pride Fest, where we can come out and boldly claim God's affirming love and justice, we are also partnering with other congregations to bring a film, a documentary called 1946 to the Varsity Theater. And this uh, film is about what happened in 1946 when the NRSV uh, translation of the Bible changed the translation to include the word homosexuality. It wasn't until 1946. Isn't that something? And so we're going to help sponsor this film and bring it to the varsity so that we can inform and educate folks about this terrible misinterpretation It'll blow you away. I think Alicia's seen it. Last fall. Yeah. It's really good. Um, Do you have a date, right? Yes, July the 21st and the 28th. It's going to show two Sundays. And there'll be a panel discussion afterwards. And I believe I'm on the panel for the 28th. And we're going to, Downtown Disciples, once the tickets are available, because we think it's going to sell out, that's why we're doing two showings. Um, we're going to, Downtown Decide is going to buy a block of tickets so that you can get your tickets through us and in case, you know, they run out. We want you to be able to have the, have the tickets. And if anybody needs financial help with that, we can provide it that way, right? Um, so, so that's one of the ways that we're going to deal with this situation that I think Jesus is dealing with with his own community this debate that is really important and this is where where why another reason why I think Jesus is so uptight is these things matter how we interpret and determines how we live our faith and so people's lives can be destroyed over an interpretation, a word, an inappropriate word added in 1946. People's lives can be destroyed by the way that we live and interpret our faith. And so, yeah, Jesus is uptight about this. And so he says to them, look, you, he's, he's really calling them out. 
you all are favoring your own human traditions over God's law. And he gives an, one example, which is kind of confusing to us, this, this thing about the Corbin. So the Corbin was an offering that, uh, that was pledged to the temple. So if you said, I'm going to tithe 10% or whatever, and then uh, what Jesus is saying is that the, some of the religious leaders were telling people that it was okay for them to use the money that they were using to support their parents as Corbin. So they could say to their folks, sorry, can't help you, gave it to the temple. Yeah. <laughs> and look, we want, we ask for people to support the ministry and work we do because we believe it is important life-saving work that we do together as a community. But please, if you have vulnerable family members, take care of them, right? Jesus is saying, lead with your heart, right? Don't, do not uh, abandon your most vulnerable family members because how did parents survive in that time and place? Their children, right? Their sons primarily, right? They're the ones that had the money, um, usually. So to say, oh, sorry, I'm giving it to God or the temple, right, instead of you, leaves them really vulnerable. And it's, those are the kinds of things that really get Jesus upset is like when we, what, we're not gonna heal on the Sabbath? Of course we're gonna heal on the Sabbath. Uh, he, Jesus did things from a place of compassion, and I'm not saying the religious leaders didn't, but sometimes we can all get a little distracted with, with things and, and maybe get a little off track, right? And Jesus is, is inviting them to lead with their heart. And he's saying, look, uh, these things that you are prioritizing are run contrary to the intention of the law. Because we remember when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest law, the greatest commandment? How do he answer that? Love God, love your neighbor, right? And love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? So Jesus wants people to lead with love. And some of these interpretations of the law excluded people or left them more vulnerable. That's why Jesus was upset with his disciples when they said, you know, don't let the little kids come around. And Jesus is like, these, they represent the most vulnerable people in our society. Yeah, I have time for that. So we have seen this happen. This didn't just happen in Judaism. This happens in every religion, right? Is people start to debate about what it looks like. Christianity, there's all kinds of debates about communion. Look, I'm gonna be gone. Um, I am so grateful and thankful to be able to go to Africa uh, in a few weeks um, for vacation and with my husband's church and I'm going to be gone, I don't have to worry about having a particular, somebody has to be ordained to preside at the table. Because in our denomination, anybody who is a disciple of Christ can preside at the table. You don't have to be ordained to do that in our denomination. But churches have all kinds of arguments about communion, about who can, oh, how can a woman, Fatma and I were just having a conversation this morning. A woman, a woman can be a, 
Preacher, can you believe we're still arguing about that? Yeah, we're still we're still debating. A married man. A married man, a married queer man, uh, or a married uh, heterosexual man, right? We we have, so we want to be careful not to be too harsh on the Jewish folks because Christians we we argue about all uh, all this stuff. We have our own. That's right. So what do we get from this? Jesus wants us to make it a matter of the heart. He says, look, it's not, it's not about food. It's not about what we put in our bodies. It's what comes out. Yeah, it's what we spew out, right? Do we spew out love, compassion, affirmation, justice? for exclusion, hatred. And so, I mean, that sounds simple, doesn't it? Be loving. Be, but <clears throat> how do we know we're coming from that place? Because surely the Pharisees and the scribes, you know, thought that they were coming from that loving place. So how, how, do, we, how do we know that that we haven't got sidetracked on some, you know, tangent um, where we're excluding folks or not being compassionate. Um, and I think that one is we do it by having meaningful conversations together, not just among ourselves, but with our interfaith and our ecumenical partners, right? We, we, are, we open ourselves up to being questioned and maybe even to have some people say, hey, I think you're being a hypocrite, right? Um, to allow ourselves to be in a place where we are humble about our faith and to be willing to be critiqued and to self-evaluate. And also, um, Jesus continues to come back to this throughout the Gospels. He spends significant time in spiritual practices. So doing the, the things that bring us to our heart place, right? Praying, singing, gathering, breaking bread together, uh, discussing Bible studies, the things that draw us into our heart center, silence, but also dancing, right? <laughs> so good news, the faith is constantly changing and adapting. That's what we're seeing happen here. Jesus is, is interpreting, changing, adapting, not getting rid of the law, right? He says, I did not come to abolish the law. No, but adapt to the needs. We, we know how to do this. We had to do it during lockdown of COVID, right? All kinds of churches were trying to figure out, how do we do communion now? How are we going to do it online? How are we even going to gather online? We're going to worship online. We know how to adapt. And the faith ought to be living. We ought to be able to adapt to the needs of the world and our community. And good news. We get to see Jesus do that. And we can follow his lead.